I think we should be shifting more to broad consent when we can get it. Now, there are situations where people just say, uh, I'm a minority. You've abused me in the past. I don't trust you. You get permission. Study my proclivity to high blood pressure in this data set, and that's it. You want to do anything else? Come back and tell me about it again. So partly it's a trust issue. You know, certain communities are just going to say, hell, I can barely get into this healthcare system. I don't trust you. Uh, I work three jobs. I don't have health insurance. You're yammering on about the importance of research, and I can't, you know, get my kid taken care of or get to the dentist, or I couldn't even get vaccinated during COVID because I couldn't get there. When you treat me as an equal, I'll start feeling more motivated to participate in research. This is Real Pharma, your podcast for real conversations with pharma pathfinders. In every episode, you will hear from an industry insider who has a story to share that goes beyond the headlines. No spin, no sacred cows, no hidden agendas, just stories and the people behind them. Now, here are your hosts, Dr. Nari O oh and Ian Wint. Today, we welcome Dr. Arthur Kaplan, who is a distinguished bioethicist currently holding the position of Drs. William F. and Virginia Connolly Mitty Professor of Bioethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine's Department of Population Health. He founded the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU and has previously worked at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Minnesota, the University of Pittsburgh, and Columbia University. His work encompasses a broad range of ethics topics, including research ethics, transplantation, and health reform. Dr. Kaplan is also a prolific author with over 35 books and 860 peer-reviewed papers. His extensive involvement in a variety of national and international committees and advisory roles reflects his significant influence in the field, and he has contributed to policymaking in areas such as cancer research, human cloning, blood safety, and organ trafficking. Dr. Kaplan also plays a critical role in advising pharmaceutical companies and health systems on ethical issues. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for joining us. It was so much fun doing our kind of background research on, on this topic. You know, I probably fully didn't realize how many different ways bioethics are or, or should be important in, in our lives, just as maybe a, a patient myself and, and a consumer broadly in the healthcare industry. And, and I, I'll just touch on a couple things that I think might help the audience understand all the ways that, that bioethics might be important to think about. So as of 2023, there are over 100,000 patients in the United States alone on the waiting list for an organ transplant. However, the number of organ donors is significantly lower, and this leads to a persistent gap between supply and demand in organ transplantation which makes us all think about how do we make decisions in allocating a scarce resource in, a, in an ethical way. Another example, the global market for direct-to-consumer genetic testing, so think about 23andMe, things like that, is expected to reach several billion dollars by 2025. And you know, I think we all realize there's been rapid growth in this area. It certainly raises ethical concerns about privacy and data security, the potential misuse of genetic information, perhaps by insurance companies. Artificial intelligence, right? It's, it's in uh, most of the headlines, it seems like today, but it's increasingly being used in healthcare for diagnostic, treatment recommendations, patient care, et cetera. But this also raises ethical concerns regarding bias uh, in the algorithms, transparency, uh, accountability for those algorithms. It's a growing topic of debate. Personalized medicine, I think, is, is also a very hot topic right now. This is where you're tailoring healthcare based on individual characteristics, but there's concerns around cost and access, and then potential discrimination based on, on your own genetic information. And then just the broad advances in, in, in medical technology have also raised additional questions around end-of-life care. Our ability to extend life, and this is the good news, has, has dramatically improved, but at cost. At, at, at there's certainly implications in terms of healthcare resource utilization as we extend lives. So th those are just a few things that jumped out at, at me and, and kind of got me thinking about, wow, you know, this touches our lives from beginning to end and in so many different areas. And, and we're all trying to figure these things out. And I hope we can answer some of these questions or at least explore some of the answers to these questions during this discussion. And we'll dive deeper into some of these topics. 
but Ian just covered a really broad way, range of potential areas where bioethics are important. And I know you've worked in, in many different fields as well, or in many different areas of this field. But for those of us who are not that close to this field, how would you describe what bioethics means in your own words, Dr. Kaplan? Well, there's really two angles. One is medical ethics, which is issues at the bedside. So when we do get into debates about is it ever ethically acceptable to withhold treatment from a dying person? Is it ever ethically acceptable to not treat a woman with anorexia who's been uh, just not able to respond to efforts to treat maybe seven, eight, nine eating disorder hospitalizations? Can you ever say it's futile and we're going to stop? We have many states that have put in laws that permit physicians to uh, assist in dying when you're terminally ill. That's clearly an answer. When some people say, do we ever get answers? Yep, we have changed the law in 10 states, and now we're allowing that. And that practice is, by the way, up for consideration in a number of states right now in the November election, so it could easily expand. We have a uh, beginning of life. The Pope recently came out and said he opposed all forms of surrogacy all forms. Well, I think that's wrong. And uh, we sometimes in bioethics will try to invoke principles that can gain agreement. For me, the Pope, what he should have said, or maybe what he was thinking was commercial surrogacy often exploits poor women. Well, that I would agree with. But I don't agree that all forms of surrogacy are wrong because I think when a sister helps another sister who's lacking a uterus for some reason, to have a baby, that's not only altruistic, it's commendable. I think it's a pro-life good thing to do. And the child that results is very much wanted. And there's no exploitation or, as the Pope was concerned recently in his statement, a uh, violation of dignity. On the other hand, I'm involved right now in trying to change laws in New York State so that commercial surrogates get their own legal representation. Right now, the person who sets up your contract with the couple or individual who wants your surrogate services, they control the lawyer. That's not good. <laughs> You're at a complete disadvantage. You should have your own independent legal representation. We're going to change the law there. Again, to something that Ian commented on, I think a lot of people think, well, there's ethics and you know, you go on endlessly and debate this and that, and you have your views and I have my views, but we don't get any place. Totally wrong. We often get places. In fact, in our lives, we have many areas of consensus. When I first started doing bioethics, I believe in the 18th century, but it was a while ago, um, doctors did not give you your diagnosis if they thought it was a uh, a bad diagnosis or a terminal, they would just say, you don't need to know, we'll take care of it, we'll do our best. We don't have that anymore. Everybody gets their diagnosis and you could refuse it or try to say I don't want it, but the default is we're going to tell you what's wrong with you. Similarly, in human experimentation, it used, I'll tell you what I learned at Columbia Medical School when I was there. The head of medicine said to me, well, here's how we get subjects. We go down the Bowery, find poor men, offer them meals and a bed for the winter, and we experiment on them. But well, we don't do that anymore. We don't have the Tuskegee study anymore where we lie and exploit people and say you're getting treatment when you're not because we want to study a fatal disease, but we need a control group, or we're going to withhold the care because we're racist. So today we have informed consent. I know many people are not thrilled about IRBs, but that's where they come from, institutional review boards or research ethics committees, which I defend. But at the same time, I think they could use some reforms. They're, they're often uh, onerous. But nonetheless, the principle for having them put independent eyeballs on research protocols to make sure that no one's being lied to and that the science is sound, I think those are good principles. So. Bioethics will operate, as I said, at the bedside, medical ethics, but it will also operate in the policy areas, health policy, research ethics, even synthetic biology, questions about the creation of life, life extension, should we try to freeze our heads and 
live forever uh, in cryonics. And that's the broad area of bioethics, anything to do with the life sciences. Thank you. I think that helps a lot just in terms of kind of framing up the breadth of, of this field and some of the key areas that we'd like to focus on, actually. And I was, as I was kind of thinking through the, the order of questions that we might pose to you, I was thinking, well, let's start off with an easy one. But you know what? None of these are easy. They're all, they're all mm-hmm. sticky. They're all challenging. And you had mentioned informed consent. I'm going to start there in the context of research ethics, I think, more broadly. But last year, the family of, of Henrietta Lacks reached a settlement with Thermo Fisher Scientific over that company's use of her, quote unquote, immortal cells. So Lacks was an African-American woman that passed away due to cervical cancer uh, in 1951. However, her cell line, which was propagated from a sample of her cells, were harvested without her consent and remain in broad use to this day. So in light of this controversy, how should we balance scientific progress with ethical considerations in human subject research? And and I'm going to tag on just a, a part two to this question. Some would argue that stringent ethical regulations hinder that scientific progress. So how would we respond to that viewpoint? Well, the Lax case is very interesting because, you know, the uh, cells that produce the immortal line came from a tumor. And so you might argue that it wasn't even really her tissues. It was something that was trying to kill her. Interesting. Yeah. That generated the uh, immortal cells. I think that has been lost as part of the story. I think there's another angle that's lost. Was Lax the victim of racism? Yes. Johns Hopkins, where she went in 1951 absolutely had separate wards and they were racist and they weren't discussing things with anybody who was in there for care in terms of what they were going to do with tissues. But I have to add, in 1951, if they pulled off a tumor from you or, for that matter, amputated your leg, there was no discussion with anybody. I think there was racism present, but it's not like people were getting consent to use white people's tumors in 1951. They weren't. It was just worse if you were African-American, but it wasn't. People in 1951 were wondering what to do with medical waste. They didn't see uh, most tissues as a source of anything useful. I think uh, they were shocked to see when this one guy took a flyer and tried to see if he could grow cells outside the body from cancer. He knew that cancer cells grew. So that's what he was doing for the most part. Nobody said, well, I mean, it was barely an understanding of, uh, I think Watson and Crick hadn't yet published in 1951. So you don't really have a situation today. So what I'm saying is, yes, we've come a long way from situations where we treated people as a kind of free fire zone, take what you want, do what you want, uh, try to turn that into profitable uh, uses. On the other hand, it was pretty limited in 1951. And I'm not totally at ease with the way that story has been told again and again, whether it's the NIH or in the book about Henrietta Lacks or in the Oprah Winfrey movie, which I watched about Henrietta Lacks. It it ignores the fact that, uh, well, again, plenty of racism in healthcare in 1951 It wasn't as if there was a distinction between whites or blacks as to what they were told about taking their tissues and trying to turn them into something. There wasn't really that. Um, So that aside, I think today we have tried to move forward to say, look, there is uh, some value in tissues and uh, waste materials. Um, We can convert some things into useful products that has happened uh, with monoclonal antibodies and other data sets that have been used to produce, you know, uh, big data, genomic maps, data sets about uh, proclivity to disease analyses that give you algorithms about risk factors. And these are all profitable for somebody once they make the investment uh, in them. The solution to date has been to say people still have the right to consent. If you want to use their genes, their tissues, their organs, whatever, you need their permission to do so. I think that's a sound principle. I don't think we can just take things from people without their permission or use them commercially without their permission. 
And many people will say, but yeah, but you know, that slows us down. It's waste. For, I mean, what we're talking about frequently is things that are, let's go on the human waste side or maybe taking an extra bit of tissue around the margin if you're a surgeon, nothing to be missed. And I grant that. But the overarching principle is you don't have to participate in research, nor do I. It's a choice. It's not a duty. Could be made a duty. We never did. So it's altruistic gift giving that drives research on the part of subjects. That's how they get there. We don't draft them. We don't say, hey, you're using healthcare. So reciprocally, you ought to be in research. I've argued that that might be a stance that makes more sense, but it isn't policy. Policy is nobody has to do it. And if you're going to use my body or my mind or my behavior, or my customs, my social habits, you need my permission. That's especially true if you can identify me. So it's one thing to take data that's been anonymized and data that's been grouped and you can't work back to where it came from or who it is. We're a little less worried about getting consent. But if I can track back to an individual and say, this data came from that person, they have a right to say yes or no, particularly in an era where people could use that data for a variety of purposes that have nothing to do with a particular research project. So maybe I donate my data because I want people to study my risk factors for cancer. Someone else shows up and says, hey, as long as we've got those genes, why don't we say if you have a risk factor for depression or uh, a risk factor for alcoholism or something that might be stigmatizing for me? could be used to penalize me on the job or maybe limit where I could go in terms of military service or something. So do we lose speed and do we lose certain opportunities when we say it's up to the subject to have to give permission? Yes. Is it hard to explain to subjects what the heck we're trying to do with their genetic material or biological material? Absolutely. I mean, you're talking to somebody who's done a lot of efforts at informed consent from people who aren't quite sure where their genes are, much less what you're going to be able to do with them. But overall, the overarching principle, unless we changed it, you control your body. Things can't be taken from you without your permission. And you don't have to participate in research if you don't want to. It's something you have to choose to do, that's the context in which we're in. Can I, can I ask you a hypothetical, though, just to, to kind of build on, I think, what you're saying? Let's imagine, you know, uh, Ms. Lack's situation maybe set in present day. And for whatever reason, she denies consent. She doesn't have to have a reason, but that's her choice. And somehow the researchers, let's say, that, that are involved have the foresight to completely understand the value and the benefit of her cells. So looking into the future, they, they understand that this could help millions of lives, save countless lives. At what point is the, the standard of, of informed consent outweighed by the value, potentially the benefit that could be provided? Is there ever a tipping point there or is it absolute? Because again, just to add on to maybe this extreme situation, if I'm a researcher in that situation and I have a child that could benefit from those cells, it would be very difficult to adhere to the standard that you described. And maybe that's a failing of the individual that, that, that society just has to understand and, and uphold that standard. But as the individual, it would hardly seem that that's the ethical choice. Well, remember, that's why we put that committee in place between that researcher and that tissue. They have to approve too. So it is. I get the idea that I'm going to rescue my wife or somebody by getting access to a really interesting sort of a, a, a vital bit of, let's say, DNA or mRNA or something that I've extracted. But I can't do it because that committee's not going to let me do it. They're still going to sit around and say, where is permission? Now, it doesn't mean that we can't go to bat and really try to switch our modern day Henrietta Lacks into consent. I mean, we could do things, and I've seen this done, like Today, there are many patient advocacy groups, cystic fibrosis comes to mind, but there are many others who are working with research and saying, you can have access to our biological materials and we'll work with you, but you're going to split the profit if anything results. So it's a new 
world of saying, uh, 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 wait a minute, you're not just going to get this and run off into, don't give me just the speech about saving lives. We want our lives saved, but we'd also like a share of the money so we can continue to fund more research or do services or whatever they're going to do. So you're seeing a change. Many of these patient advocacy groups are now saying, you want to play ball with us? You want to build a registry? You want to study a rare disease? You're going to have to uh, cut us in. Yeah. A follow-up question to that, Dr. Kaplan. You just mentioned that patient advocacy groups are very aware of how the system works, and so they rightfully asked to benefit also from something that they provide as a service. So there's a lot of debate about what should be the way we look at genetic information. So companies that collect genetic information, and maybe there's also an issue with how much consent do people really give, or are they really aware of how much they're giving away? But should there also be a mechanism that those people benefit from any outcomes, any profits? And how would we regulate that? Well, it's a great question. First of all, there is an internal debate in bioethics about consent in that space, Nari, because some people say what we should do is get broad consent. Here's my genetic material. Use it for research now and forever. I don't care, or I do care, but I'll give up my worries about control and being informed. Uh, I'm going to be very altruistic and just give you this. And if you can extract some value out of it and get somewhere with diagnosis or cure, that good for you. Others say no. They still believe in what we call specific consent, meaning you can have this for this purpose, but if you're going to use it for any other purpose, you need to reconsent me or drop me out of your data set. So that makes a headache for researchers because who wants to go around trying to figure out which you know percentage of people have to drop out of the data set and you want to track down people for reuse, but maybe it's five years later and you don't know where they are and who knows half of them may have moved and 10% of them may have died and it's a headache. So I'm a fan of broad consent. I mean, I think that's where we should begin. I think that balances the desire to make progress and advance quickly. And I believe many people will still be altruistic and say, I'm not worried about getting my share. I'm not worried about getting a cut of the profits. I'm not even worried that much about my privacy per se. I want you to speed up either science with respect to my disease or my family's disease or just general disease. So I think we should be shifting more to broad consent when we can get it. Now, there are situations where people just say, I'm a minority. You've abused me in the past. I don't trust you. You get permission. Study my proclivity to high blood pressure in this data set, and that's it. You want to do anything else? Come back and tell me about it again. So partly it's a trust issue. You know, certain communities are just going to say, hell, I can barely get into this healthcare system. I don't trust you. Uh, I work three jobs. I don't have health insurance. You're yammering on about the importance of research, and I can't, you know, get my kid taken care of or get to the dentist, or I couldn't even get vaccinated during COVID because I couldn't get there. When you treat me as an equal, I'll start feeling more motivated to participate in research. Fair enough. I think that there is no easy answer and it's an evolving field. And we may have to just be more flexible with addressing this evolution of how much data we can collect, what we can do with it, and how, how people see consent. By the way, one issue that I'm actually working on right now that's a cousin to this to try and encourage participation, I have a paper coming out fairly soon, on the need to inform subjects of the results of studies. So if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see that almost no studies are reported back to subjects in a way that they could understand. Some people do post papers, and in theory, you could go to clinicaltrials.gov, find your study, and find the publication that resulted, although my comment there would be good luck to you. It's not such an easy website to navigate. It wasn't built for that purpose. It's not. It's built so the NIH can have a storage of papers that came out of their funded work. It's not a consumer-friendly site. But 
I think if we want to encourage people to be in studies, then we have an obligation or a duty to say, and we'll tell you what happened. You get inconvenienced. You put up with some risk of adverse events. Uh, you're the one who schleps on the bus to come in here for the clinical trial. We promise to tell you in language you can understand what happened. And not only are we not just going to post it, we're going to outreach it to you. We will email it to you or send you a letter. I don't know, whatever it takes. So there's an area, again, where bioethics me is trying to think ahead and say, we're not just here to say no or don't do it. We're trying to think about steps you could take maybe with treating people more like partners, but you hear that rhetoric rather than subjects. Try to involve them and say, yeah, whether it worked or it didn't work, or we learned nothing, or we had great progress, we'll tell you. I think that would encourage people to participate. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a fascinating idea. Yes, because as you said, you you treat people like partners and you close the loop. It's not just about you gave us something, thank you very much, but what happened with that? What is in it for you? Yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, I've been in studies over the years, partly just to check to see what the heck happens when you're in a when you're a subject. Not always great, but usually pretty good. But no one ever told me what happened. <laughs> Nobody. Right. You have to look it up yourself if you yeah. if you know how to do that. And I think I especially like the idea of really meeting them where they are. So it's not on them to try to find it, but you proactively provide that information, which yeah. I think they deserve to have. And you know, you can also provide it with videos or you could tell a story. I mean, there are a lot of ways you could do it. You don't have to do it like, here's the uh, statistical significance of what we found. Right. And, you know, they, they don't care. They want to know what to learn. It has to be meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it could be it could be a win win between pharma and and the patients as well. I mean, patient recruitment is so difficult. Yes. And pharma companies, you know, like to brag about what a great job they do in terms of direct to patient communication. So they have folks probably on their marketing teams that are good at that, translating complex concepts and information into, into patient friendly uh, messages. So, yeah, that's a great takeaway. And again, I'll stress this. I think sometimes people think bioethics. That's just something that gets in the way. It's bureaucratic. It's going to slow me down. I don't really care about it. I don't see it that way. Part of the reason I don't see it that way is because I rarely meet subjects who say, could you build a big bureaucracy and make sure that nobody ever does anything because I, I'm happy to be sick? I mean, what they say is, could you move fast? Could you, I'll take some risk. I, you know, I want to move. And I honor that. That's what they want. They don't necessarily need protectionism all day long. So part of, I think, the goal when I teach at NYU or uh, when I try to give public talks is to say, look, part of your job is to think about ways to move faster. That's where I got this idea of reciprocity. seems to me we hear a lot of discussion, for example, about recruiting more diverse people to clinical trials, which has failed and failed and failed no matter what anybody seems to do. I think one step is to say, We'll tell you what happened. We'll put it in terms that are culturally sensitive and, you know, education up to the education level of whoever it is you're recruiting. Treat them as partners. Treat them with some notion that you respect them. Then you'll, I think, may get a better result. Anyway, it's a idea. I'll give you one other one since it's on my mind to debunk the bioethicist as a just say no enterprise. We, as some people will know listening to this, NYU has been involved for some time now in trying to use animals as sources of organs because of the shortage that uh, Ian mentioned earlier with uh, transplantable organs. So we've been trying to transplant pig organs that are genetically engineered into human recipients. Very experimental. I looked at the situation and said, hey, You know, in phase one studies, when we're trying genetically engineered pig organs, there's a pretty good chance that we could kill the recipient. And in two efforts to do that at the University of Maryland, that's exactly what's happened. But I said, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. Why don't we use people who are brain dead as a platform to test the uh, use of these organs? We'll put them in externally. We will get consent from family members. We will only use people who said, I want to be a transplant donor, but they couldn't, too old or whatever. There are many reasons why they can't. 
So we'll get a good consent. We'll agree not to keep them as an experimental model for more than, you know, two weeks so they can allow a funeral to happen. And anyway, I came up with this platform idea of let's use the brain dead in these transplants. And we are. And believe it or not, we got it through the IRBs and we got it through the hospital administration. And when I first brought this up to my friend, Bob Montgomery, who's our chair of transplant and chair of surgery here, he said, you're nuts. We'll never get to do this. And I said, yeah, we can. It's the right thing to do. It'll move us faster. We'll get more safety. You'll be able to do more studies than you would have done on a living person because they're dead. So you can test more things that you may want to test. And we built a special unit with special nurses, and we are doing those experiments. You'll see them reported in the press and in journals right now. So that's another example where the aim of the enterprise of bioethics is sometimes to say, let's go outside the box, let's think hard about how we might get this done, and then let's fight to get it through. Now, I can't say every bit of bioethics does that. It doesn't. And there are certainly people around who get nervous at the first sign of risk and so on. But that's not my model for the for the enterprise. I mean, I think you probably are often in a situation where you bring up ideas that are very uncomfortable to a lot of people at first sight because you have to push the boundaries. Yes, exactly right. I mean, I'll tell you, I just had, I just had this consult. I mentioned the anorexic woman. Because we just did have a situation where a young woman, 15, had failed mental health treatment for her eating disorder and bulimia, I think it was eight times. And her psychiatrist said, I think we should let her die. I think we should allow her to stop eating because she's not, it's becoming futile. Staff doesn't want to deal with her, her weight, she's completely frail. She's as bad off as a terminally ill cancer patient. And I happen to agree. At some point, we do declare futility. And I know there are many in mental health who would say, well, you can't do that. She's not competent. I think she is competent. I think she's got a terrible disease, anorexia, but she knows where she is. She knows what's going on. She gets the consequences. It's an impulse or a drive that she can't control, admittedly. I get that. But at some point, she has the right to say enough with this already. I don't want to get artificially fed. I don't want to be fed IV or through a tube. It's hard to say, and I certainly would want it reviewed by the ethics committee, not just the doctors and me, but there's a really tough call where, you know, you're going to get pushback. Some people are just going to say, if you're me- you got any mental illness, you can't do that. Period. End of story. We're done here. Um, I get that. I hear the view. I just don't agree. Let's talk about a few other topics that are probably also in that same category where you really are at the intersection of medical innovation and ethical considerations or, you know, and or, you know, there are just no easy answers. So you just mentioned organ transplantation, and I know you've done a lot of work in this area. And certainly we have this chronic um, shortage of organs versus the number of people who need an organ. And there are some interesting developments now with, as you said, you know, um, genetically created organs or 3D printed organs or other innovations. But at the moment, we still are facing this shortage worldwide, not just in this country. And there are some considerations, first of all, with all organs in terms of how should we decide who gets organs that are available? Should it be based on medical need, medical urgency, potential outcomes, ability of the recipient to take care of the organ. And then especially for living donors, uh, you mentioned something earlier in terms of with surrogacy. Do we have enough provisions for these donors to feel that they're making a decision based on their free will or what they want? Or is there an element of coercion or lack of really informed consent. So what can you tell us about this? And I know, again, you're an advocate for ethical practices in this area, but what kind of framework should we use for organ transplantation? How many hours have we got left for the podcast? (laughs) Uh, It is its own gigantic 
topic. I know it's very broad. But uh, you're right. I've been working in this area. How far back? I helped create the original uh, distribution system. Uh, it's called uh, the United Network for Organ Sharing in a 1984 law when I was a mere pup working with Al Gore to create the uh, National Organ Transplant Act. So I've been looking at distribution and shortage and transplant for a long, long, long time. So let me start with living and then I'll come back over to who. So for living donation, I support that. I think people can donate a kidney. I fully uh, support their ability to do that. And by the way, in the emerging world of uterine transplant, which we're starting to see, even though the Pope doesn't like it, uh, there are people doing it. And uh, oftentimes it, the donor is living. It could be a sister, a mom, a friend donating their uterus. They've had enough kids. They're ready to do that. And there are cadaver uteruses that are obtained too. And it isn't quite clear yet, by the way, which is better for producing babies. Uh, the advantage of the living donation is you can schedule the operation. It's not an emergency. When you're using cadaver organs, it's always a panic emergency situation. You know, it's like, well, they're dead. We got to get in here and get the team together. You don't know where the team is. Team could have a bad flu and they can't operate that day. And so you miss the chance. So living has at least that advantage that you can do an orderly procedure. Living donors have uh, a framework, and that is they should be able to choose. We've all agreed for many years that they should be altruists. We don't pay them. But what's happened too often to living donors is they wind up getting financially penalized because they have travel or babysitters, or they got to go to a hotel, or they don't go into work. I think that's wrong. The reason we don't pay people to be organ donors is we're slightly afraid of exploitation that the very poor will wind up doing this. And it's happening, let's be real. Oh, yeah, around the world, it's a huge problem. You can imagine the guy who has gambling debts and somebody shows up and says, eh, time to pay your debts, buddy. There's your kidney, you know, and we think we can get that done. That does happen, by the way, in different parts of the world already. So, and there's also a fear, by the way, if you pay, the more you pay, the more people lie about their health. So you sort of put the quality of the organs you get at some risk. There's even other objections that come up about payment, which uh, basically are that a lot of the major religions are opposed to payment because they don't think you own your own body. It's a gift from God. You may not care. I may not care. But if you got 50% of the evangelicals and the Catholics to tear up their donor cards, you're not going to be in a better position than you were in allowing payment. So all that said, we should pay expenses. No one's doing it for profit. They're just trying not to take a loss. And I, again, have been pushing for state legislation in New York State and elsewhere to say, let's cover reasonable costs. You need life insurance. You need health insurance. You need uh, some kind of compensation for time loss from work. You need... Uh, daycare help. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Would it really increase the number of living donors? I don't think a lot in the U.S. I think it's still a major operation. A lot of people who have relatives might be inclined to do it, but strangers just coming out of the blue to say, yeah, I'll donate a kidney to X, it's rare. I mean, and I don't think it would get, by the way, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, even if you paid people, it's a one-shot payment. So let's say you gave me $75,000. Well, that's great, but it's not a full-time job. I'm going to be looking for money again <laughs> if I was poor within a couple of years. So I don't think payment is the answer, but I think it's the right thing to do for expenses. Would it help us get a little more in terms of living donors, probably, but not going to solve the shortage. It's it's a help, but it's not it's not the answer. And to, so I think we're going to be facing some scarcity over the next couple of years. Maybe we'll get printable organs. Maybe the pigs are going to work. Maybe we'll see regenerative medicine, which, by the way, is the ultimate answer, not the pigs. The elegant solution is just grow back the damage in your heart or your liver and 
don't be running around with immunosuppression, <laughs> trying to saw organs out of dead people. I think that will be viewed as, sorry, transplant guys, somewhat primitive uh, in the future, some future. Uh, you know, you want to grow things that are damaged That's that, with your own cells. That's the, I'm, I'm more a fan of stem cell and regenerative medicine in the long run. Although artificial organs, you know, they may give us some relief as well. So we're going to face scarcity and what to do. And I'll, as I said, I could spend a while on this, but I'll just say, when we first started in transplant, the outcomes were poor. And so that's where you got people who are the sickest because the doctors who did this and the nurses didn't want to feel like they killed the patients. They were going to die anyway. So at least if they did die, you didn't feel bad because you didn't know what you were doing, to put it bluntly, or they immunosuppressive agents we had at that time, talking the 80s, uh, were not that good. Got better drugs. They work better. We got the genetic engineering that we could use on a pig and so forth. We have better matching abilities for blood type and antibodies than we did when I first saw this. So it's a safer procedure, and that is le- safer procedure, and that has led me to lean more toward uh, weighing efficacy. Seems to me we do have general agreement. If you're on the lifeboat and some people aren't going to be able to get food or water, we got to make some sacrifice. We can either draw straws and see, you know, by random fate, who's going to get the water and food when everybody can't. Or we could just say we're going to share it till we all die. Some people have. Or we could say we're going to take the people who are close to death and not give them food and water in order to rescue some of us. That's the camp I'm in. It seems to me saving some lives is what we do, is the right thing to do when we're trying to ration resources. However, got to add a codicil. Age may matter. So if we're squaring up efficacy and it's 10-year-olds versus 60-year-olds, or even my age, 70 I I think that counts, and getting more life from an organ ought to matter, not just being alive post the transplant. So if I can get 40 years of additional life by giving somebody a heart or a liver versus just looking at actuarial tables, five years of life, I'm going to take age into account too. And then, Nari, I'm going to tell you one other terrible fact about rationing. Who do you think is the toughest group? in terms of getting good outcomes if you transplant them? That's a trick question. It is somewhat. We're going to offend somebody here. The hardest group are adolescents. They don't comply. They don't like taking medicine. They're pains in the asses. They often will lie about whatever the hell it is they're doing, and half of them are fighting with their parents anyway about who knows what. And even the immunosuppression can sometimes change your appearance, which they don't like either. If you look at strict efficacy, if you're like 13 to 18, there's a big dip (laughs) in outcomes. So I guess I'm not quite willing to go total efficacy because I'm not quite willing to kill the teenagers. But it is a dilemma for me because those are the those in people who get retransplants are the toughest in terms of outcomes. But I think that goes back to the question of should it matter how well you think a recipient can take care of the precious organ? And do we have enough data to be able to say that? And should that be a consideration? But I mean, we, we've, we've seen that, right? We, we know that, for instance, for liver transplants, if you're an alcoholic, I don't think you can get a liver because your chances of success are very low. You got to be sober for at least a year. Some programs will say two. Exactly. But I'm telling you, the worst data, the worst is adolescence. I, I bring this up just to torture myself because I'm a big efficacy guy, but they stink. And weight, overweight, I mean, significant obesity, it drops down no matter the age, hurts efficacy of transplant outcomes. There are certainly also factors If you live alone and don't have someone to help you, that starts to hurt efficacy too. So you're penalizing people who live alone and there's nothing, you know, wrong about living alone. But we know if you don't have a helper, that affects compliance in the management of a transplant, post-transplant too. So tough, 
it's a tough area. But generally, I'll answer the question by saying I lean into efficacy and then start to decide if we want exceptions, like those poor teenagers. Right. Then maybe just a quick follow-up question on that. If we had no shortage of, of organs, if we had a sufficient number of organs for everybody, would that change your thinking? Oh, yeah. First of all, the shortage is worse than you think because we're already excluding people who are very old. Nobody over 80 is offered a transplant. Everybody knows they're not going to. But if we, it's like cancer treatment. We treat people over 80 for cancer. You don't just say, well, no, <laughs> sorry, too old. We're not going to try. And there are other areas where we definitely do hip replacements or some other things that are expensive. So remember, they would come into the pool if we had enough organs. They may only live a year or two. The success rates might fall, but some of them would say, I want a transplant. Give me a shot. So that's one change that you'd see pretty quickly. There are a lot of people around the world who don't have access to transplants. If we had enough organs, we'd probably try to expand services to poorer places. Egypt or uh, countries that are mid-level development could probably do it, but they don't have a system to get organs. And so that would expand pretty quickly. And then the other thing I think you'd see if we had enough organs, quote unquote, is you'd probably see um, some effort to really try to concentrate on transplant center outcomes more. Right now, we have centers that have different rates of success. We tolerate that because we have new ones and ones that aren't experienced. But if we really became routine with a lot of organs, we wouldn't put up with it. Yeah, as, as the parent of, of some adolescents, the challenges that you mentioned <laughs> resonate with me. I, I can understand that. Uh, it's unfortunate to hear, but uh, I think maybe we all understand where that comes from. So let's let's change directions just a little bit. As a designated pharma commercial person on this on this podcast, I want to get into pricing and and just healthcare resource utilization, maybe more broadly. And I'm going to start really kind of in the rare disease space, ultra rare disease space. And I'll give you an example uh, that you can respond to. So in 2019, Forbes published this article with kind of a provocative title. So the title was the $2.1 million question, what are the medical ethical implications of the world's priciest drug? And what they were talking about is at that time, the FDA had just approved a drug called Zolgensma. And it, at that time, became the world's most expensive medication. It was priced, uh, as the article says, at over $2 million per patient. It's a one-dose gene therapy and a potential lifesaver for children with SMA or spinal uh, muscular atrophy. What are the key ethical considerations? And really, this is maybe more of a health policy question regarding access to expensive treatments. And how do we justify the allocation of limited resources to very expensive treatments that really only benefit a handful of people? Well, it's very interesting. I think the rare diseases generally, or even the ultra rares, get attention to the needs of those people out of proportion to their numbers. There are many groups organized around, you know, Rett syndrome and uh, you name it, whatever rare condition you can think of, whereas there isn't an organized lobby for women who need blood transfusions after a C-section or, you know, people who get uh, smashed up in the street in car accidents and need uh, a lot of trauma care. They're not organized. <laughs> they don't have any lobby at all. So we have to understand that part of our health system responds to who agitates, who lobbies, who's noisy. That's just how it is. I'm not saying it's ethical, but there are many, many chronic health needs, and some are stigmatizing. There's very little, I, I don't think there are going to be too many marches down the street for people with urinary incontinence, but it's a big issue. And for many of the mental illnesses, same problem. So I'm not sure we do well in balancing what the orphan or rare disease people need relative to the chronic conditions. I'm also sure that in the age of genomics, it's a little easier to chase the orphan and ultra rare because they're often single gene mutations or something that it allows CRISPR or something to be used to alter a gene that it is trying to figure out what the hell to do about non-compliant diabetics or something. So part of what happens is we map the genome, we get all excited, pharma companies decide they can go into the area and make a difference uh, by using genetic engineering and gene therapies, um, and they can. But again, 
it's not from a public policy point of view what the prudent investment in healthcare would lead you to do. And by the way, the more prudent investment in healthcare would lead you to spend more in prevention, uh, not just therapy. So, you know, obesity is a big problem in the U.S., but we have many issues around the need to prevent recreational drug. You look at the list of why people die and suicide and drug abuse and motor vehicle operation without help. You know, it's a big, long list. It's not that mysterious. You could invest more in it. And I think morally, we probably should. All that said, when an individual is identified and making a plea, it's hard to say no. That's psychology, not ethics. It's hard to say, you know, Nari's kid, I'm sorry, but we're going to spend more on bicycle helmets because we'll get a lot more return on that one than trying to give you the $2 million therapy. So that's reality. And I'm also not saying that we shouldn't build something into the system to help the rare diseases. But where I think what we're not doing is is funding it right. There should be insurance as part of our healthcare premiums that's used for funds to pay for rare diseases and experimental treatments, by the way, too. We don't we have people yelling for them even before we know that they uh, do any good. So we're taking money out of Medicaid sometimes and throwing it toward a rare disease. That's crazy. Asking the poorest people to fund the $2 million experiment, I can't justify that. We need to refinance what's going on. Now, some people are going to say, well, maybe the $2 million price is bogus. And look, I think there is some bogus pricing going on out there. The fact that our drugs are more expensive than everybody else's, as is frequently noted, is a problem. But I'm not sure those $2 million price tags are bogus. They are probably what it costs them to do the work and set up the research and, you know, do the trial of N of three to get the stupid thing some evidence and information about it. So I tend to be a little more trusting, weirdly, of the million-dollar intervention than I am the uh, price that's put on, you know, the uh, $15,000 heart medicine that I could buy in the UK for 7500 Yeah, I think that there are, you know, it, it, those do get highlighted and maybe outsized attention from the media and, and, and maybe folks like us and, and pharma it's a relatively or very, by definition, small patient population. But I wonder if there are advances that from that research that, that benefit downstream other populations, right? Other fields of research. And ultimately, maybe there is some value add in the whole effort. If you look at it individually, you know, maybe it's hard to justify that one decision. But across, you know, kind of the broader landscape, maybe it, maybe it is more justifiable. Yeah. That could be. On the other hand, I'll repeat something. We are right now in industry, but also in medicine, obsessed with genetics. I mean, everybody's running around building genetics departments. Every Some of the companies are saying, well, we get out of the orphan disease thing. I'm not sure what the money is, but they're not shutting down their genetic units. They're just moving to uh, other disease situations where they can predict risk and maybe intervene using genetic knowledge. But sadly, environmental intervention is getting short shrift. I mean, you can control asthma with an inhaler. You could also control it by cleaning up the air. You know, it's sort of, you can see it time and time again that there might be an environmental climate change, trying to reduce heat deaths. I, I could, the list is pretty long, but the NIH doesn't have a big budget for environmental intervention. And I might add the NIH doesn't have a big budget to try and figure out how to get people to not listen to misinformation and make more prudent choices. So even when we show up with vaccines, we have a lot of people saying, I don't know, I don't trust them. I'm not sure they're safe. And you're sort of like, well, how do we change their minds? And it's not like we have social science studies that are going on in a big way to figure out how to do that. So I'm bothered a little bit by our I'll call it genetic reduction obsession, uh, as if, you know, it's all in us. And if we can just fix our genes, we can live in a heated, polluted, dangerous world. <laughs> it's like, it isn't all in our genes. It's a great point you make here. So one is, there's this interplay, of course, between almost nature and nurture. We, we, we don't exist in a vacuum. So the area that you work in, bioethics, 
is, of course, intersecting with other areas as well. Of how do we control the environment or how do we improve the environment? But um, maybe it's also, you know, your point about genetics. It's just a new hot thing. And I was actually going to ask you a question about that. Maybe it's just easier to understand that we can make small interventions that have a very dramatic and visible effect, whereas it takes much more time, effort and money. And it's, it's just not as quickly to see when you make changes to the environment. Oh, I really agree with that. I, I really agree with that. You, you're going to get change if you do something about air pollution, but it's going to be over years. If you shoot a gene in a vector into some poor kid's genetic error and get a response, that's pretty rewarding and it's right there and it's right in front of you. So I do think you're right, Nari. I think some of the environmental interventions are slow and incremental, but they have big footprints. I mean, they just have big, big, big footprints. Even think, you know, you just look at uh, situations again um, where you're trying to figure out what are we going to do about suicides or drownings or poisonings and things like that. And I think in areas like poisoning, we set up a system, we got numbers, people call, the ERs are ready. That really was a very useful environmental intervention that did yield, you know, very, very good results. I think vaccines are over on the same end of the spectrum with a very good return, even for HPV vaccine, which is more expensive, but you look at the cervical cancer rates around the world in women under 30, amazing to see them fall. So I'm not saying give up on genetics. I don't mean that. But, you know, we, we should in our budgeting start to take into account a little bit more balance in terms of where we're going to get yield. Okay. So last year in December, the FDA approved a milestone treatment, JB, which is the first cell-based gene therapy for the treatment of sickle cell disease that's based on CRISPR, which is a genome editing technology that uh, is now in, in, on everybody's radar and was awarded the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in 2020. And it's a very precise way of, of editing genes. And that's in stark contrast to a few other stories from earlier in the 21st century. So in the early 2000s, there was a Korean doctor, Hwang woo who cloned the first dog. <laughs> I'm, I'm, te I'm tempted to say maybe. Maybe, yes. So <laughs> he went from being the pride of Korea to basically a disgraced scientist. And not just because of the controversy about his work and cloning, but he, he actually also falsified uh, results. So that's a different story. But then we also had in 2018, Chinese doctor He Zhang Kui in Hong Kong, who really shocked the world when he revealed that he had created the world's first gene edited babies, um, purportedly to make them resistant to HIV. And he was actually sentenced to three years in jail because his methods were deemed as medically unnecessarily, ethically irresponsible, and he really was condemned by the scientific community at large. So now back to where we are with CRISPR today. What are the bioethical concerns that you have or maybe just considerations around this topic? Well, I'm not worried about fraud, although it has been a problem in gene editing forever. Announcements of cloning announcements of genetically engineering embryos. It has been in the background for a long time, uh, for some reason, attracted everybody from, you know, scientists in Korea to crackpots. Uh, anybody remember the Rayulians? They announced they'd cloned a baby and were running around maybe 15 years ago with the press chasing them as if they were legitimate, whereas they were as culty a coop collection as you'd ever find. But the success of sickle cell therapy creates problems. So one set of problems is, if it turns out that the intervention for repairing sickle cell anomaly is not as precise as we think, and we get hits on other parts of the genome, and there are adverse events, do we have a registry set up so that we would know? It's one thing to track the initial subjects, but now sickle cell is a pretty common disease. It's not ultra rare by any means. And uh, we need, I think, to have good monitoring and surveillance in place, but I don't know that we do yet. To make sure we look to see what are the side effects, if any, 
from this intervention. It's a one-off. It's not like we're going to keep administering it, but it would be very useful to track some cohort to make sure, you know, the targeting used in CRISPR is accurate and just doesn't influence anything else. A second question in uh, facing treatment for uh, sickle cell is, this is not germline therapy, right? So you're still going to have the disease spreading with more people living (laughs) after they get, uh, let's say, uh, body cells or uh, 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 engineered. That's good, but it doesn't mean we've eliminated the disease, disease. So are we ever going to get in the position where we could say we're going to modify an embryo? I'd like to see the disease go away, not have to continue to do gene therapy, you know, on hundreds of thousands of people uh, to let them avoid the disease of sickle cell. And the big problem is how are we going to distribute this? Because most of the sickle cell isn't even here. It's in poor places in Africa. Um, They can't do it. It's very hard to bring them here or bring the therapy to them in terms of the infrastructure they've got. So it's going to be kind of a boutique thing, I think, for the next few years with, again, the need to figure out some kind of finance mechanism. Is the Gates Foundation going to jump in and help? Are we going to see the Rotary International mount a campaign to do something? You get where I'm going. Yes. Where we Where we are now is not where you know, the world of sickle cell, those in need uh, would like to be. So it's probably the continuation of what we see now, which is we have effective treatments, but the access is an issue because it's unequal. And often the majority of patients are where the medicines cannot go easily. Yes. And it's also more than just the treatments, right? You need the infrastructure, as you said, you have to have the right providers, education and so on. And I'm big on these registries, even to follow some of those people, you know, are we going to be able to monitor what happens to them? Right. But as we get better, as the technology gets better, right, we can address more and more, let's say, diseases or or even getting into kind of things that we might define as defects or undesirable characteristics that we have as individuals. The cost and complexity are still going to probably be high, right? Higher than, you know, other interventions. Yeah. So are we going to set up a situation where, you know, we could be headed down the road towards eugenics or societal inequalities that create this this gap between those that can access this technology and those that just will never be able to access it? Shortest answer you've gotten through the whole podcast. Yes. (laughs) I mean, I really think you are going to see that division emerge. It's somewhat there now between the rich and the poor countries. It's partly there already. You look at the lifespan in Mali or Niger, I don't think it quite compares to Belgium and, uh, you know, Korea. It's a different setup and that we tolerate it. We're not exactly running around saying, oh, my God, that's morally heinous. We should help them more or take less or whatever. So I'm going to say yes. And I'll say one other thing, maybe a way to wrap up. If you watch parents near where I live, I'm in Connecticut, but if you watch Manhattan parents compete to get their kids into the right nursery school, you offer them some genetic intervention that's going to make their kids do better or switch it to Singapore or you pick your favorite, maybe China. I don't know. Uh, Yeah, they're going to do things that they think will give their kids an edge. And ethics or not, I think you're going to see that sort of disparity emerge. Without really knowing what the long-term implications might be, right? Yeah, yeah. But we may not be that far away from that. I mean, that just might be a handful of years away. I mean, theoretically. Well, you know, actually, I don't mind that all happening because it's good employment for bioethicists. It gives a, <laughs> something for the next generation to do. I don't think you're going to be out of work anytime soon. We couldn't even <laughs> cover all the questions that we wanted to cover today because there's just so much to talk about. Thank you for your time, Dr. Kaplan. It was such a fascinating discussion. Well, thanks for having me. Maybe one last question to wrap up the podcast. So as somebody who's a pioneer and has been a pioneer for apparently 200 years now, is there somebody or something that has inspired you on your journey or continues to inspire you in your work? Yes. I'll tell you uh, who I am a big fan of and read every once in a while, and that will surprise you, but it's Ben Franklin. I thought Ben Franklin was an interesting scientist 
someone who wanted to reach out to the world, was a politician, a diplomat, and an ethicist. So I like the combination of the traits. I like his optimism. I like his willingness to uh, sort of straddle uh, different fields. I wouldn't claim I do the same scope that he did. But yeah, he's a person I think that gets neglected a little bit, but made, you know, when he invented the lightning rod, what did he do? He gave it away. Great, great example. I love that. And certainly a Renaissance man, you know, in many ways. So great way to close out the podcast. Thank you so much for the time. Give us a whole lot to think about and hopefully help us navigate a more ethical path forward uh, in our careers, uh, in our lives. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to connecting again in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. So great discussion with Dr. Kaplan. I, I really enjoyed that. And, and, you know, to be honest, it, you know, bioethics is not something that I think about every day as, you know, in terms of my pharma career, maybe it is something that I should think about more. And I think in, in a broad sense, we certainly encounter some of these ethical issues, but we don't kind of think about them through all aspects of our job. And I think one of the things I, you know, takeaways for me is just how many areas of healthcare and healthcare delivery and, and from a patient's perspective, how many areas bioethics really does touch on. There are these important issues, certainly historically, but I think arguably even increasingly important today with the advancement of technology. Like we didn't even get into AI and a few other things I know we wanted to talk about. Maybe there's another day for that. Right, right, right. But increasingly, I think this is an important topic. I think we'd all benefit from from learning more about it. And I, I know I did in talking to Dr. Kaplan. I agree. It was almost overwhelming to try and cover, I mean, even just the key topics that we wanted to talk about related to bioethics. I think it must be very challenging to keep up with the development of of medicine, of science, of the healthcare environment, because the questions change sometimes really rapidly, right? Based on the progress that we make in these fields. And I can imagine that, like I said in the in the recording, a lot of this is very, very uncomfortable. I mean, these are not things that people want to talk about or want to think about, but somebody has to do it. And it affects many of us in, in different ways, but these are really tough topics to think about and, and have an opinion about. And I'm sure most of them, if not all, are somewhat controversial because somebody will always disagree. But like you said, they affect really life from beginning to end. And so it really feels like he is a, he's a pathfinder that helps navigate some of these very tough questions for all of us. Yeah. And, and just kind of building on that a little bit, I, I was surprised by some of his answers, right? I, I wouldn't have guessed. M me too. Yeah. And and because they are tough issues and they're difficult to think about, certainly more difficult to deal with if, if you're in that situation or, or a family member or a loved one is in that situation. And, um, you know, gave me pause a little bit because, you know, I, I had assumed he was going to answer one way and he answered a different way. And but that was helpful just to understand the issues and, and how difficult they are to, to navigate. And what I think is important that people like him who deal with this all day, every day, base their opinions really on, on science and data. Whereas I think for most of us who were, who would be in the situation kind of as a participant, it would probably be much more emotional yeah, and much more difficult to really come to a conclusion. And so I, I assume he has that level of distance where, or that degree of distance where he can't be pulled into it from an emotional perspective. Well, that's why we need professionals like him to, to help us figure all this out. And this was a, a certainly an educational hour or so to wrestle with those issues. And certainly, you know, we're not claiming to have solved anything, but hopefully every, help everybody understand them a little bit better. It was really good food for thought, for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, another great episode, and thanks for the great discussion, Nari, and I look forward to the next one. Same, Ian. Bye. All right, bye now. Thank you for listening. Please visit us at realpharma.co for more valuable resources. Real Pharma is brought to you by Black Canyon Ventures. Mm -hmm.